Yeah, great. All right, well, thanks very much for inviting me along this morning. Very pleased to be with you, even though I'm uh, down in London. Um, great thing about Zoom is that we can do this all together. Um, so the buzz about bees, the importance of bees and how to help them. So glad to hear that you're receiving a, a bee saver kit. Um, and that will obviously help you with uh, your local bees. So I really want to tell you a little bit today about lots of those different bees and the best ways that we can, in fact, help them and why we need to help them. So um, a little bit about me. I'm a journalist. Um, co-author of four bee books, um, the latest one, The Good Bee, one of you will be able to win. And I'm co-founder of an organization called Urban Bees, which I set up with my husband a number of years ago to help educate people and to work with communities and companies in London to um, really help bees to thrive in towns and cities. So bees in the UK. It might surprise some of you to know that we actually have more than 250 different types of species of bee living in the UK. Most people think of, um, they might think of a honeybee, but we've only got one species of bee that lives in a hive and makes honey. And we've got 24 species of bumblebee. Now, bumblebees are the ones that most people think of as a bee. It's a big, fat, round quite cute bee that we see on the flowers in our gardens, striping. But actually, most of the bees in this country are what we call solitary bees. There's over 200 of them. They're quite small, probably wouldn't notice them, brown, black, not even stripy, um, but they're all incredibly important. So these are some of the bees you're likely to see in your garden at the moment, and because the weather's quite nice, where you are, you might even see them this afternoon. So the, we can see here there's four different types of bumblebees that are out this time of year. A buff-tailed and white-tailed bumblebee are the ones you're most likely to see just because they're big, they're very common, they're easy to spot. Early bumblebees, tree bumblebees are also out. Um, but we've got the, um, the honeybee as well. Some of you, if you live near anyone with hives, you're likely to see those in the garden. What the bumblebees and the honeybee have in common is that they're what we call social bees. They live in colonies with a queen bee, worker bees, which are all female, no surprise there, and the drone bees, the males that really just, um, just have sex, really. And that's their, their sole job is to carry the genes for the next generation. So they live in what we call colonies. The honeybees can live up to about 50,000 of them in a hive at the height of the summer. And the bumblebees, maybe about 200, 250 of them in a, a much smaller colony. But the solitary bees and the ones on this chart that you might see in your garden, the hairy footed flower bee, for example, which is quite big and round, looks a bit like a bumblebee. The red mason bee and the mining bees, these are all solitary bees. They've just got a female, comes out in spring or in the summer, she gets mated, she lays her eggs in a solitary nest on her own, then she goes away and dies and the eggs hatch, eat and um, emerge as adult bees the following year. They tend to nest quite close to each other, a bit like us living next door to each other on a terrace street or in a block of flats so often you will see a lot of them together especially the mining bees tend to come up through the lawn or through um, bare soil so you might see a lot coming through but actually they're all solitary bees and on the right hand the bottom right hand side there's something called a bee fly that not surprisingly a lot of people mistake for a bee because that's what it's trying to do it's mimicking a bee the telltale sign is its spindly legs you can see those, that's a, that's a dead giveaway. That's definitely not a bee. So they're just some of the bees you might see if you go out this afternoon in your parks or gardens. Doesn't matter what type of bee it is, what they all have in common 
is some people might think what they have in common is that they all sting, but actually they don't. The solitary bees don't sting. And bumblebees very rarely sting. You've really got to um, get in their way. They've got to feel like they're really under threat to, um, to sting. Um, what they all have in common is that they all pollinate. And the reason they pollinate flowers they visit is because the flowers have actually evolved over millions of years to attract the bees to pollinate them. So those beautiful scents, the beautiful uh, colours of the petals, it's all designed to attract the pollinators. And the pollinators will go to the plants because the bees only eat food from plants. They only eat pollen and nectar. So they're completely dependent on the flowers for their food. And when they go to the plant, they will be collecting the pollen and the nectar. The pollen is the protein that they need to take back to feed their babies, take back to their nest or to the hive. And the, the um, nectar is the sweet carbohydrate drink that the honeybees will take back to a hive and turn into honey, which they store and it's their winter food. That's, that's why the colony will survive in the hive during winter on its honey. And the other bees will use the carbohydrate as a, as a fuel. It, it fuels their flight while they're flying to and from the nest. And so they're totally dependent on the flower for those, those two products to eat. But the flower... Um, needs the bee to pollinate. So when it collects some of the pollen, it's also transferring some of the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. And as a result, the flowering plant can then have fruits and seeds. And as a result of that, an incredible one in three mouthfuls of everything we eat is pollinated um, by um, pollinators, mainly, mainly bees globally we've got over 20,000 species of bees and they're even pollinating things like coffee and um, you know, so many fruits and vegetables that we we eat um, regularly and all the nuts and seeds as well but it's not just us that they're feeding important as that is they're feeding the whole of nature so the fruits and nuts that the small mammals and birds are eating as well so that's really why they are so incredibly important all those wild bees as well as the honey bees which we often take into the orchards to do the commercial um commercial pollinating for us now, the problem is that a lot of these bees are under threat um and they're under threat because basically they've lost a lot of their habitat so over the years, due to things like intensive modern agricultural practices, we no longer have the hedgerows, we no longer have the wildflowers. In fact, in, in um, the UK, we've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows since 1945. And as, as a result, there isn't so much food for the bees. And also urbanisation, we've concreted over a lot of land and those areas aren't particularly hospitable for pollinators but we can help there are things that we can do in our towns and cities to help the bees one of the main things we can do is that we can help them by planting year-round bee friendly flowers and um, it's quite easy really um, here's some examples of flowers that are good for bees at this time of year so there's mahonia it's a shrub quite a prickly shrub that you find in many parks and it's been flowering actually all winter and some of its uh, different types are now in flower um, in the spring. Crocuses, of course, we all love. Har Harbinger of spring, great for those bumblebees we saw earlier. And pulmonaria is a great one for the hairy footy flower bee. You want to attract that lovely bee into your garden. Also, trees are an incredibly good source of food. If you think of how many flowers are on a blossoming fruit tree, um, they're out everywhere at the moment. I mean, in London, it's a bit cold for the bees to actually be out pollinating the fruit trees, unfortunately. But I think where you are, um, it's a bit warmer, so they will be out. So if you go and you have a look at any fruit tree at the moment, 
If you look up, you'll be able to see bees buzzing around, no doubt. Um, if you've got a small garden, these are a couple of good trees for bees. A crab apple comes out a little bit later, and this cherry okame that comes out as early as February, very good early, early food. The bees fly from around, different types of bees fly at different times of the year, but Generally, from February to October, you'll see some kind of bee flying around if there's the food food for it. Um, general rule of thumb is daisy-like flowers, very easy for the bees to get the pollen and the nectar, or a saucer-shaped flower again. This um, geranium roseanne on the left hand, top left-hand side, fantastic um, food for bees, and it flowers all summer. And the other thing the bees, the wild bees need, is uh, places to nest. Some of you might recognize <coughs> this is a, a bee hotel. You can buy these in lots of garden centers now. It's a collection of hollow tubes that some particular solitary bees, the red mason bee we saw earlier, will nest in some of those tubes. The honeybee obviously is okay because it's looked after by the beekeeper. It's in a hive, so we don't really need to worry about the honeybee. But the bumblebees, a lot of them actually live underground. They might live just under a pile of old leaves. So if you can leave some old leaves in the corner of your garden, that would be fantastic. Or under some old moss or under the shed, even in compost bins, they can be found sometimes. Bumblebees only last the summer. So if you can just leave it for the summer, in the winter, the colony dies out and the queen bee, she will go and hibernate and then come out the next spring and create a new colony. So leaving your garden a bit wild is very good because the bumblebees can nest under the, 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 the wild parts of the garden. This is the kind of bee hotel that we like. We've got quite a few of these. This is our garden shed. And we've put a whole row of bee hotels facing south along um, under the eaves of the shed. These are cylindrical bee hotels. And this is what it, they look like inside. It's a collection of cardboard tubes. And you can see that these are plugged with some, some uh, it's actually a bit of earth. And that's the red mason bee. It will go and collect earth and it will plug plug the bee hotel so you know that the tubes are being used when you can see that they've got mud soil packed in at the end there and this is a lovely little red mason bee being born i just can't resist ever showing that that lovely slide of the bee eating through the the mud and coming coming through in the springtime and these are leaf cutter bees so you see that these ones are actually collecting leaves and plugging the holes with um leaves they've collected often from rose bushes so gardens aren't always that keen on leaf cutter bees but incredibly important pollinators and we can easily help them with these tubes for nesting you can even make your own do-it-yourself bee hotel with some cut bamboo and an old um, water bottle just make sure it's attached securely not swinging around and it's in a, a warm place about a meter off the ground you should be okay and you can also try and make a, a bumblebee nest yourself um i've not had much success with it but i have heard they do sometimes work the ones in the shops don't but you could try using flower pot upturned bit of nesting material apparently they they often use rodent holes in the wild little rodent holes that mice have used for nesting so if you've uh, you've got a pet shop might not be open now but in the future you might be able to go in and get some uh, some old mice nesting material and, and stuff it into your flower pot, upturned the little bit of hose pipe um, and leave it there. And this is the time of year that a lot of bumblebees are out, the queens are out looking for a new nesting site. The other thing, finally, is just to provide a drink of water if you can in your garden. Just a saucer will do. Um, they're, they're on the rim of the saucer there because they bees can't swim so the other thing to do is maybe put some pebbles or some stones in the water and then they can they can um, land on those and they won't drown so that's just a very quick uh, run through some of the bees and how you can help them so 
planting year-round bee-friendly flowers, shrubs and trees. If you haven't got a garden, you can do it in window boxes, patio, a few, um, few patio planters help. Or you can speak to your local park or other provider of green space nearby and you'll be surprised to know that you're probably knocking on open door because bees are so popular these days that councils and uh, landlords want to be seen to be helping bees. Creating suitable nesting sites and materials is also important, providing the water, ditching the weed killers and the pesticides because they are bug sprays. So, you know, bees are bugs, so they're going to affect the bees as well. If you can possibly bear to not mow your lawn, if you have got a lawn, leave it for a few weeks longer to let the dandelions and the clovers flower, which is very good early bee food. Um, yeah, and basically lobby your council, the golf club, the housing developer, the landlord, anyone you know that could make a green space better for bees. Um, give them some ideas. Say you'll even get involved. And I'm sure, as I say, you're knocking on an open door. Some resources that might come in hand if you want to know more. That's um, the Urban Bees website, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, a wealth of knowledge about bumblebees. Um, if you want to go out trying to ID bees, then the Field Studies Council has a fantastic pull out, very simple guide to the bees of Britain. If you want something more substantial, you know, you can get a huge grade um, field guide. The field guide of, of bees by um, Stephen Falk is, is, you know, the Bible, really. But starting with the, the FSC is a good place to start. And just a little bit, but a bit more about me. Um, I've got a monthly bee blog at the Urban Bees website, and you can follow me on Twitter at Alison Urban Bees, Instagram, Alison underscore Urban Bees, and... Um, Facebook, although I don't tend to do that very much, bees in the city. So I hope that's a good overview, and I'm very pleased to answer any questions that you might have.